agreements across jurisdictions, both in public law and policy, corporate governance, and legal tech and edutech. She's also the founder director of Two Good Advisors Private Limited, a boutique consulting firm with an interdisciplinary approach to better governance and business management solutions. Ma'am, today will be talking to us about technology and the classroom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a long day and uh, energy is flagging, although interest may not be. So being mindful of that, I promise you, I will not take up more than 25 minutes of your time, if at that. So um, today's conversation has somehow veered off towards law and technology uh, in the course of the last couple of discussions. And there's been a lot of discussion about the kind of experimentation that needs to happen, the kind of innovation that needs to happen in the classroom, what we need to use, what we need to do. And it doesn't really answer the question of, I have to teach for 16 hours in a classroom. How do I make that easier for me with the tools that are available? Okay. What if I work with a law college that doesn't have the resources that some other premier law colleges might have? What do I do if my systems themselves do not allow for me to go and purchase software or technical tools? Or if, what if my students are such that they don't have their own systems, they don't have their own, um, you know, they don't have backgrounds where they have the ability to go back home or go back to their space and use those tools, right? So how do we still look at technology? So to start off firstly, I wear many hats, okay? So um, throughout the next 10, 15 minutes when I'm speaking with you, I'm not speaking at you, I'm going to speak with you. Um, I will be juggling those hats. So as I will be speaking as somebody who teaches uh, both young adults and adults, I do a lot of work in legal tech. I do a lot of corporate investigation. And I also employ. So I will speak as what I look for as a potential employer. I will speak from the perspective of being in the classroom where students have next to zero attention span because you know they expect a fantastic Instagram reel to play out to hold their attention, which is not going to happen, right? And I speak as somebody who is a teacher who has to mark attendance, who has to set assignments, who has to examine all those assignments that are turned in, who still have somehow has to research, then get that research published in a Scopus Index journal, then somehow turn up for conferences, seminars and network, and in all of this still keep an eye on the future. I can't do all of those things. I'm not a superwoman. I'm not a superhuman being, right? I'm a human being. So the solution, if one can call it that, is simply trying to get basic technology that already exists out there and seeing how it makes our lives as educators mildly easier. Not very easier, but mildly easier, right? So, um, I do have a presentation, but technology doesn't support us. Technology doesn't support when you're talking technology. About technology. So, I, I was incredibly lucky to, to have some fantastic law teachers when I was doing my undergraduate studies and uh, the one thing that I learned is that a really good teacher can teach with no tools. Yeah, You should be able to sit across each other without even a table and still communicate information from one to the other in a positive, safe environment. And if you achieve, achieve that, that's good teaching. That's it. That's all that is needed. When we start talking about professional education, medicine, architecture, engineering, law, we tend to gravitate towards individuals with expertise, people who bring a lot of um, gravitas and glamour to their chosen area. But we sort of stop asking this question, is this person the right teacher for that subject? Because being an expert in a subject doesn't necessarily mean being the best teacher of that subject. SaaS based products, who knows what a platform is or to, you know, what's the difference between a communication platform and a contract management system. These kind of questions, fantastic questions. Um, using 
that, I would say that we can break down the, the correlation between technology and law into two major areas. One is where technology is administering the law, which means your software and your systems and your processes that make life easier for you either as a law professional or as a law teacher, right? So for instance, why do you send assignments via email? Because email is aiding what you're trying to do, right? It isn't in any way inherent or exclusive to the study of law. I can turn in my assignment in long form handwriting and technically it would still be accurate and acceptable and you would get the content that you need to as a teacher to evaluate whether I've understood or not. But sending it by email is just making the administration, administering of that class easier for you, right? So imagine this, technology and law intersect on two levels. One is where you are using technology to manage your class. Yeah? So, what she mentioned, what I mentioned about synchronous and asynchronous learning, where you record videos of yourself and let students watch it to catch up if they've missed classes, or where you allow them to join online using one of your Zoom or Google Classrooms or whatever have you, right? That is where it's aiding your ability to teach. But the bigger piece is where technology is intersecting with the law which is where I now wear my researcher and corporate investigator and ask you to do similar switch between being a teacher and being a consumer, a citizen, a human being in society. Think about it. Can you think of a single subject in law which has not been touched by technology? Is there a single subject? There isn't because that is the nature of technology, the easier, okay? For instance, if I was to ask you how many of your students are doing exceptionally well and how many of them are lagging behind, you would have to go back to your attendance sheet or what have you to look up, look up the names, look, then we call your personal interactions and then come up and tell me, okay, I have about three students who tend to talk most of the time and I have about five or seven students who uh, require extra hand-holding office hours and stuff. But if you were to do this on Google Sheets, all you would need to do is click because it would give you a graphical representation of what your classroom performance looks like and it automatically is generating the data that answers the question. What have you spent on this? Nothing. I'm, is there anybody here who does not have a Gmail ID? Everybody here has a Gmail ID. If you have a Gmail ID, free, not your institutional ID, your personal Gmail ID, you can simply go to the drive, put in your data in a Google Sheet and ask for it to convert to graph. There, technology has solved your problem, right? Um, as an as a educator, I'll tell you this. While I can do it and it's an easy enough thing and it's stood the test of time, Doing attendance sheets is one of my pet peeves, okay? I really dislike doing attendance sheets. Anyone else here who really struggles with it? Like, it's just something that I just don't want to do. Because in my head, if I'm interesting enough and the subject is interesting enough, the student will attend the class. And if the student doesn't wish to attend the class, then they don't wish to attend the class, right? It's a, it's a simple binary conversation in my head. Uh, but the thing is this. Google Sheets has a simple one-click template to record attendance and it made my life so much easier. I would love to do that last five minutes in class every day simply because it was easy enough for me, right? All that we're trying to say is tools that exist, use them to the best advantage in the classroom, right? Uh, we've already spoken about plagiarism checks. We've already spoken about attendance and, you know, uh, assignments. How many of us have ever used what is known as a contract management system? None. One person. But in all fairness, ma'am, I'm asking the educators. So here's my question to all of you. If you teach contract, the law of contract, or if you teach CPC, or if you teach evidence, do you know that your student who graduates in three or five years time is 
mandatorily going to have to interact or use a contract management system. If they become lawyers or in some shape or form work with the legal profession, whether they work as an in-house counsel, whether they work in a law firm, wherever, they are going to have to know what is a contract management system. There is no alternative. Yeah, that is the way the world is working. But if as their teacher, you have never seen that beast, how do you train your student to tame that beast when they graduate? Right? So, having insight and informational intelligence into these basic tools is not about innovation anymore, in my opinion. It's about need of the art. Students, when they graduate, I, I, now I'll put on my employer's hat and I'll tell you this. If I have two candidates in front of me for an associate level position, which means I expect freshers right out of college, right? They are both pretty much from similar law background, similar colleges, similar performance. Everything is great. But there is only one position. I need to make a decision. The student that doesn't have any internship or practical experience in using learning management, contract management, database management, court e-filing system, as opposed to a student who just got very lucky with her internships and interacted with these systems and has some familiarity, who do you think I'm actually going to gravitate and choose? Right? The second one. Simply because I have to do less work to train my new employee. Right? So, getting students up to scratch with these basics, no brainer. Has to happen. Um, what kind of technology can we use? Uh, learning management systems, right? Things like Coursera, ma'am mentioned. But there are so many more. Have, has anybody here heard of the term Moodle? Fantastic. So we all know what Moodle is. It's basically a system or a platform where content can be put out. Learners can put out questions. Teachers can put out answers. Attendance can be recorded. It's a learning management system. I'm talking about a situation where Moodle now is on its seventh generation, right? And yet we have law colleges that in no shape or form employ learning management systems. And what does what happens then? At the end of the semester, students will turn up, ma'am, please adjust, ma'am, I can't afford to miss. Please give me attendance, ma'am. Please give me five marks for internal assessment, ma'am, please. Yeah? And we have these conversations. Why? Because there is no transparency in how we are recording this data. It is still in pen and paper format. Or it is in, if you do this online, every change is tracked as history. So every change in every number, in every cell will show, show up as history. Right? It, it just leads to much more streamlined, faster ways of working. Um, one big piece that somebody mentioned here, we need to democratize and diversify the way we teach for the people sitting in our classrooms. We do have neurodivergent students. We have neurodivergent teachers. We have language challenges. We have economic, socio-economic challenges. We have gender-based challenges. Yeah? We have technology to some extent that helps minimize those gaps. Voice to text. Text to voice. Yeah? Podcasts. Audio content. Fantastic way to retain and relearn what you sat in class and, and forgot after the class was over. Right? So much easier to go back home and listen to a podcast while going for a run or you know listening to an audio book. It, is, it, is it any wonder that we aren't really publishing and producing groundbreaking theories and internationally recognized acclimate? you know, stuff. Where is the time? If we are going to burden our law teachers with doing tasks that can be automated and taken off their plate, we will give them the biggest gift of all, the gift of time, the gift of space. When the mind is free from having to do daily tasks, it has the freedom to think, it has the freedom to explore. That's when you can start expecting quality research coming out of law teachers and law educators in the country. Right? Take away these shackles of bureaucratic, tedious, time consuming tasks that technology can help. That's the take. 
Now, I promised you that, um, I mean, there is, there is enough content that I can put out here, but I'm going to take you to the, this part. Because I started and touched upon it, that there is no subject of law today that does not have an intersection with technology, right? For instance, the Constitution. How many of us know that the right to internet access is now an internationally recognized fundamental right? Yeah? You know that. Why? Because technology has stepped into constitutional law. Right? Uh, commerce, banking, finance, tax, procedure, criminal matters, individual, family issues. There is not a single subject that can be taught without at least one module or one chapter where we say in this manner information and communication technology ICT what we are using has intersected with this particular subject that I am teaching or that I need to teach right uh, evidence CRPC CPC these are the obvious ones but what about pharma what about healthcare law how about women and children right uh, children's protection, all of this has an immediate and direct intersection with technology law. But how many of our course manuals, how many of our uh, beginning of the semester submissions on what we will teach actually contain a module dedicated to the intersection of technology and that particular law. And to supplement what we want them to read, articles from international publications, you know, the usual suspects, Mullah and Sirvai and all of that. How many of us are also including? And by the way, check out this link on YouTube. Fantastic channel that does short bites on how to file an FIR. Fantastic bites on what is a custodial dispute for minor children in Indian matrimonial cases. These exist, but it is for us as educators to spend that time collating all that information and putting it down, right? So I would say that uh, technology and law intersect on two levels, quick recap, administratively, administering the classroom and subject wise. Um, observations and inferences, these become important. Researchers to have real value and real meaning, researchers, academicians, teachers need a working appreciation of technology. It's very simple. It is hard for me to learn from somebody who does not know what they are teaching me, right? So if you are teaching very simply insurance law, you need to know what cashless insurance claims are and how do they work. And the reason they work is because there is now recognition of technologically enabled cashless insurance payout in medical and motor insurance cases, right? So, it's no longer a good to have. I personally believe for us to have the somewhat moral authority to teach, one needs to have at least a working knowledge of what one is teaching, right? So, this whole debate that we have, should you practice first, then become a teacher? Should you be mandated to do some sort of community work to teach a practical subject, all of that? Perhaps we take a step back and say, Ethically, maybe first acclimatize ourselves to this reality that ICT is here to stay. It is no longer an othering. It is a part of our life. Right? I don't think there's anybody here sitting today who hasn't used Ola, Uber, Swiggy, Zomato, Amazon, Flipkart, Bracto, Tata 1MG. The reason I'm using these particular ones as an example is because this is nothing but technology enabling a particular service that all of us used to access offline before this technology existed. So if this concept is existing in every other aspect of healthcare, pharma, engineering, um, supply chain, uh, management, commerce, why is it not happening in law as well? The entire judiciary has gone online. If at but I can access pretty much every order, every court online kind of behoves us to have classrooms that allow us to do that, right? So that was the premise that I wanted to bring to you.
Um, I think I have stuck to my promise and kept it within 25 minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but I can see the fatigue. But you can find me anytime you need to, and I'd be happy to have this conversation. In fact, I hope that many of you might be interested. We are trying to do a workshop on more specialized integration between technology and the law classroom. So if you're interested in that, please do come up and speak to Manu Patra and me about it, and we'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. You've been a very patient audience.